No, they should be. But then the sessions the sessions kind of start as soon as we join. So we are now live and out there after the appointed hour. So uh, thanks, Sunesh. You are the CTO. That's correct, right? CTO, indeed. Yeah. CTO of Sevo Cloud, um, a great Kubernetes backed uh, public cloud. So I'll let you introduce yourself and take it from here. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you, Steve. Um, firstly, I just want to say thank you to everyone at the Sidero team for putting this on. Um, I know how much stress these events can be, and it looks like it's going absolutely <laughs> flawlessly at the moment. So that is no mean effort to do. So very well done on that. Um, so I guess let's see if I can get screen sharing working, which was working, but you never know how these things go on the day. Okay. But that looks like that is that is up. So yeah, today I'm going to be talking about building a public cloud and powering it by Talos. Um, sort of go into a little bit of the background of what our journey is, what a public cloud is, maybe less relevant given the talks that have been happening today, but we'll, we'll kind of get through it and see where we go. So I'm Dinesh. I am CTO of Sivo. I've been involved in the hosting industry for about 15 years now. Um, and really, I really love building products that scale. And I think public cloud is one of the biggest challenges around scale, um, both in the technology sense, but actually in the people side of things as well. And getting people to understand working in an environment that scales massively is a really interesting challenge because I find a lot of engineers are really, really uh, used to an environment where you're managing five, 10, 20 machines, but as you start going into thousands of machines, your mindset really has to change. And I love seeing people grow in that and really flourish in that environment um, in, in a public cloud. So Sivo, for those of you that, that don't know, we are a public cloud provider. We've been around for around five years now, and we're really focused on building a cloud that challenges some of the common narratives around kind of what hyperscale offers our hyperscalers are offering at the moment. So our key focus when we came to market was being developer focused and making things really, really easy to use. Um, and we're now continuing that and really focusing on a Kubernetes focused public cloud. So I think everyone has used this sort of image to death of what is a cloud and having a, a cloud somewhere and then data centers at the bottom. But you know, for most people, you're using the cloud every day, but you don't necessarily have the knowledge of what goes on behind a cloud. It's just infinite storage, infinite compute that you have access to at your fingertips. But when you get down to building a cloud, there are a hell of a lot of things that need to go into that. So you need to be looking at things like your data center choice, uh, WAN connectivity, so where you're getting your internet in and out, um, hardware, what could you use? Are you going with some well-known providers that are out there that you can ship boxes out? Or are you kind of going a bit more bespoke and you can get places that are building your own hardware? Once you've got that in place, you've then got more challenges on the operating system. And I'm going to today talk about what we historically did with operating systems and what we're doing now. And then even beyond that, the control plane as well and how you're managing the cloud and what is running on there. So going back to a little bit of a history lesson, um, I'm sure a few of you have all been here when you've been building infrastructure, um, getting your feet up at some racks and spending a good two months getting kit up and running. So this getting up and running used to involve buying hardware, waiting a few weeks for it to get shipped out, going down to the data center, unboxing it, cabling it up, racking it up, then installing switches. And, you know, usually you could get away from the office and go for two months or so saying, I'm installing some new kit. Leave me alone. Um, I've got my feet up. I have to say this data center looks like, you know, a nicer place to be. Modern data centers are usually a lot hotter and a lot louder than they are back back when this photo was taken, um, judging mainly by the, the 2U and the Dell servers sitting there. Um, so once you've got that kit all racked and stacked, the next stage was usually going on to operating system install and switch configuration. So more time in the data center using things like CD-ROM drives and then moving on to the, the modern way of USB sticks to do installs. And it was a really 
again, long, laborious process if you're going through racks and racks of kit. And then you've also got to have someone that's skilled doing networking as well, because not only have you got the operating system and the compute servers to get up and running, but then you've got switches and routers and getting those all up online, testing them. You've then got a process of burning in hardware and then testing it, making sure that it's all fit for purpose before you start going out and putting your actual production workload on it. So time's moved along and tools like Maz came along. So that is machine as a service from the Ubuntu Canonical family of products. And that uses technologies like Pixie and Cloud Init to automatically boot up infrastructure or not necessarily boot it up, but have it power on, present itself onto the network and then get its configuration and do some amazing things about auto installing and auto configuration. And um, it sadly reduced that time in the data center a little bit. Um, when we first started using Maz, when we started building this, it would do things like burn in. So as a new server came online, it would register with Maz, it would do a burn in, it would test CPU RAM. And if it was all happy and, and everything, it would just move on into the next stage of the OS install. I think times have moved on um, and the Sidero Metal project that we've been playing around with is a really kind of model impl modern implementation of that and really focused on Kubernetes. When we were looking to build our cloud, we actually didn't go with Maz. Uh, we had previous experience, but our goal was on a single interface of configuring both switches, routers, and compute hardware. So we actually went down the route of um, bare Pixie servers sitting on our network that then using cloud in it to do the OS install and then using zero touch provisioning with kind of DHCP options on the networking hardware to do that stage of install. So when we were going out to build our cloud, we were really focused on a single stop shop for everything that we wanted to do. So we're now in a position where operating system is online. Hopefully all of your hardware is validated and, and running. And we then go on to the choice of control planes. And I picked three of the more open source products that are out there. Um, so we've got OpenStack, OpenShift, and CloudStack. I feel like there should have been some variation in the naming committee, but I guess you all know what it does looking at the, the name when you go to the project. We evaluated all of these. We actually ran OpenStack for a, a few years, but we found that the products just felt like they weren't designed for a modern cloud native infrastructure. And by that, I mean this image here. So for those of you that don't know, this is the CNCF landscape. I think this image is from a few years ago because the number of products that are on here have vastly, vastly increased now. and the projects like OpenStack, OpenShift, um, CloudStack were focused on delivering um, I mean, containers in one instance, but VMs, and then leaving the orchestration of the future layers to end users to layer on top. Um, we found that with all of these tools coming on board, we could build our own control plane and use some of these projects to, to layer on top and build it. So that's exactly what we did. Um, when we set out to build our cloud, we had a few goals. And actually, the first one was this, which was being able to never visit a data center, to be able to do everything that we wanted to do, sitting at the comfort in our kitchens with a nice coffee, no HVAC systems blaring out in the background, and you having to drink gallons and gallons of water just to stay ever so slightly hydrated. So with the tools that I previously mentioned um, and us being able to do the hardware choices and the networking choices meant that we could do this. And today we have a 20 minute install process and we have four regions, which I have never sent an engineer to. The next thing we wanted to focus on was speed of build time. So when traditionally you were getting a new site or a new data center online, it could take two months to get all of the kit installed and everything. And we were really, really focused on rapid rollout. And I think our first region was live in two days and we've been halving that every time we've rolled out a new region with um, currently in testing, as I said, but down to, to 20 minutes. 
the other thing we wanted to focus on was giving our internal teams the this it just works experience from being able to manage the cloud environment so traditionally in uh, systems that we've been using before it felt like you had to do a lot of back back of the scenes work to get everything working and there was a lot of setup there was a lot of configuration and you had to be continually tweaking things to get things right however what we set out was mainly for our engineers making their life really really easy which then had the knock on effect for our customers as well of having a really lovely environment to work on because it wasn't either always breaking or the engineers weren't inside always tweaking things one of the things that went into our choices next was actually operating system. And CoreOS is the, the logo on the right for those that don't know it, but that was a amazing project. I say was, I know the project still exists, but back to what it was when it started, it was really, really focused on one thing and one thing only, which was running Kubernetes. And there were some tweaks. I think the, the project was in the early stages. I think Kubernetes was very early as well. I have, I'm not going to say fond memories, but memories of building TLS certs and trying to craft the etcd magic to get a cluster up and running and get CoreOS running. But the, some of the features that that had were way ahead of its time. Um, and then I think in the other category is just Linux. Um, it didn't feel like there was a lot of difference between any of the flavors of Linux when we compared it to the experience we were getting out of core OS. And I mean that from the Ubuntu's, the Red Hats, even the Alpines and of the world, they just always had this layer that we felt was getting in the way of what we wanted to deliver, which was Kubernetes services. In the end, we, we went with Ubuntu when we first started because because there was no real reason behind it other than it, it worked and, and we had some good experience behind it. So in the environment, once we had the operating system up and running, there were then a next set of tools that we needed to, sorry, I say tools we used here, but the next thing was configuration management. So we had this potential problem around drift. And that means that once you were up and running and everything was working, if you go back to the system after two weeks, you've likely had an engineer that's seen a problem, logged into the machine, and made either a manual tweak. And when you are building systems that are designed to scale massively, those little tweaks become really, really difficult to manage. And that drift problem is solved by tools like Ansible. But we found that we were going down the route of creating operators and the operator framework, which is a Kubernetes pattern, to manage our tenant workload. And we started creating more and more operators to actually manage the infrastructure itself. So we have an operator that runs internally where you can create a custom resource called node drain, and it will safely drain all of the workload from a single server. It will test that the type of workload is actually running somewhere else before it moves on to the next type of workload, before it marks that sorry, before it marks that compute node as ready to run maintenance on. So that could be things like OS patching or rebooting or all of the things that you need to do just to keep Linux running happily for years and years and years. Then we also started adding operators for things like user management. So as we had starters and levers, um, we didn't tie it into any single sign-on. We wanted to make sure all of our regions were really self-contained, but we have a operator that runs and users are managed through that. And then we roll it down even into things like configuration management for individual regions. And I think that's when nine months ago, when we were introduced to Talos, we immediately fell in love with it. Um, it was solving all of the kind of problems we were looking to solve with things like CoreOS and were patching on top of Ubuntu to try and make it do what we, we wanted it to do and what we needed to do which was really stay out of the way and let Kubernetes do what Kubernetes does best. And Talos does that. Um, it feels like it was built, if CoreOS was built today, um, I'm sorry, Andrew, if you, if you don't think this, but I think if CoreOS was built today, it would look like Talos. So 
we yeah absolutely love it and we started trying to get it integrated into our platform as soon as possible um the fact that we could just put operators on top of it we could interact with it with an api to drive things like node reboots um, and even all the way through to upgrades and configuration changes really fit in with the operator pattern that we had running at the moment so Moving on to the first thing that we did with Talos is we actually integrated it into our public cloud and it is there today that if you go and want a managed Kubernetes cluster with Sivo, you currently get the choice between K3s, which is what we launched with, but also Talos. And I think it's one of the first, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that do this fully automated, fully managed Talos install that you as an end user just get access to a Talos cluster. Um, it takes about 90 seconds and it's all good to go. And what we love about it from a tenant network, sorry, a tenant perspective, not necessarily a um, kind of management perspective is that end users don't really care. Talos still works absolutely seamlessly. I think I might get interrupted by a dog, a mad dog coming home. So apologies for the video stream. Let me deal with that and I will come back. All right, that is the fun of uh, streaming live from home. We get um, yeah, Sivo was the first to automatically deploy a full Talos cluster. Um, Talos as an operating system is available in places like some some other cloud providers, but only as a node, and then you have to set up the cluster. Sivo is the first one that does the full automation of a complete cluster at a turn at the press of a button. So back to Dinesh, now the dog's done. Absolutely. <laughs> Let the dog come up here. No. The, do the dog can go present. The dog, the dog can come and present. There you go. Yes. <laughs> um, so yes, the first thing that we did was we got Talos actually integrated in with the cloud. It is fully managed in that one click install process. And what we wanted to do was to validate that actually our stack would run on Talos. So by integrating it in as a tenant, hello, um, we were able to then iterate and test that we could install our stack on it. And I, I would be lying if I said it worked out of the box first time, but it was very, very quickly proven to be a drop-in replacement to Ubuntu, but without all of the back-end kind of things that we had to do with Ubuntu to keep it running. And I would probably say 90% of the issues were around Kate's compatibilities with what we were running versus Talos itself. So how we do um, Talos today is it's a drop-in replacement into our current Pixie build system. Um, so rather than sending cloud init config into Ubuntu, we're sending kernel flags into, um, into Talos, and that's then doing the configuration. And it really, really handles nicely this idea that we had of new hardware we just turn it on and it self registers and builds. And then with broken hardware, we just turn it off and we send it back. And that really has made us live this dream of never going into the data center. So within 20 minutes of hardware arriving on site and being plugged into either uh, to pre-ordered networking, so tier one networking that we purchased and the DC putting power in, the region is up online and ready to be used with by customers. So the migration uh, process, we have four regions currently that we run. And Talos was actually now in our Phoenix region that we launched uh, about four or five months ago, um, is fully built on Talos. The underlying hardware has Talos installed, and then you could put Talos on top of that. And we've tightly integrated Talos with all of our validation stacks. So we have a nightly build that builds on Ubuntu and now on Talos and proving that we're always going. And what we're next in, um, investigating is how we actually migrate our existing cloud infrastructure from Ubuntu over to Talos. Um, I think the team have done a really nice guide on that. Um, and I'm pretty sure with everything else like Talos, it's, it's just going to work. And that's one of the other things that, that we loved about it. In terms of the future, um, we are looking all new regions will be Talos, which I think is incredible for our engineers. Um, and we will be moving for our tenant clusters as well 
that Talos will be the default. So rather than K3s, um, Talos will come over and it will be the OS that you get whenever you get a managed cluster on Kubernetes. And we're really, really excited that it's going to be powering some of the new features that we're launching. So we're going to be doing a machine learning service, and that is going to be fully powered by Talos. And our platform product, which is a similar sort of Heroku thing, is also going to be fully powered by, by Talos. Then on the lines of security, which in a public cloud is, is really, really key, is we're moving towards confidential computing and partnering with Intel, uh, sorry, in collaboration with Intel on their SGX line of products to see if we could run more and more systems, maybe even things like the Talos API inside an SGX container, inside an SGX enclave. And that could be really, really interesting from a security point of view. So I think kind of where it is, I've tried to leave five minutes for questions, even with the dog interrupting me. Um, kind of end with this this slide up here that if you did want to try Talos and you've not heard of Sivo and want to give it a try, if you do sign up, you get $250 of free credit. Um, and that should be enough to get you a month's worth of Talos playing and kind of testing what Sivo do. So I guess, yeah, that's that's kind of it. I don't know if there are any, any questions, Steve. How, how do people get that $250 credit? Because that's more than your usual free credit, right? No, no, that's just you sign up. No, everyone oh, gets that's everyone. Usual. Okay. That's, yeah, that's the, yeah, that's the usual usual credit. So if you sign up, um, I think you might need to put a credit card in. But yeah, that is, that's what you get. And so I awesome. generally challenge people to try and spend it. <laughs> um, Andrew asks, any unexpected surprises moving to Talos, good or bad? As opposed to the expected surprises. It's basically, yes, it's, it's supposed to the expected ones. Um, I think, uh, to be honest, it felt really, really easy to move across. I think that was the, the really good thing about it, that I expected there to be things that we were struggling to do. Um, there were a few times I needed to, to kind of bat engineers' hands with a stick of saying, no, you can't get bash access onto this machine. You've got to work a way around it to do things like, you know, network config. And um, then on the kind of storage side as well, we use MyStore and was like lovelyly found that there is a guide on your site of how to run MyStore on Talos. And that just, again, it worked out of the box with no kind of tweaks. So the migration path was really, really good for us and surprisingly easy. It's good to hear. I mean, because... I know, you know, Talos is still a work in progress, as it always is. So things like, you know, packet capture weren't there probably when you started. So debugging some things, no doubt, has gotten easier. <laughs> <as well. laughs> yeah, I think we, we're we in a position where we've been running on Kubernetes for a long time. And I've been trying to get us to a point where I could get SSH access away from users, um, even administrators. So we had tools in place that were allowing us to do packet captures via. That was, that, that was already a goal before Talos. That before, was, yeah, 100% a goal. Yeah. Before Talos forced it on you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> um, Tim asks, how has your experience with Maya Store been? Amazing. Really, really good. Um, we have been working with them closely for about a year and a half. Um, and one thing that we're really, really good with them is that it's a partnership between us and um, my store. And I'd probably say it's the same with, with Sidero as well, is that it's a partnership. I know we've had feature requests from the team at, at Sidero and you've prioritized them if it felt appropriate or told us, no, this is how you do it yourself. Um, yes. But I've had that same thing with my store as well. So we found bugs, we found issues, we have pushed my store way beyond where they were originally doing it, but they have absolutely loved and appreciated the feedback. Um, we're in a position where as well, they're able to get debug access to our staging hardware and mm. we can run scale tests and everything there, which has been really, really good. Um, I can see there's a question also about CPU pinning on, on my store. And I think we're in a really lucky position where the, the smallest install I have to play with with this is 80 core systems. So having one CPU pinned to 100% isn't an issue for us, but I appreciate for kind of home labs, it, it, it is an issue, but I think the product at the moment is designed more for the space that we're operating in at Sivo rather than the, the home lab. Um, I don't want to steal all of the milestone questions, but 
you know, things like um, NVMe over TCP and RDMA are really, really exciting that we're working on with MyStore that gives a data center level performance that is unparalleled. I think we've seen three or four times the storage performance with MyStore compared to our previous software storage vendor on exactly the same hardware. Well, that's awesome. Thanks, Janesh. Uh, I and Andrew have to go jump on to the Q&A session. Um, people can welcome to stay here and ask you questions, or they can, if, if you keep getting questions here, you can join our session too if you want and continue answering questions over there <laughs> if you want. Uh, it, well, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't mind. Do you want me to stay here or do you want me to, to come over to yours? Yeah, why don't you come over to ours? Everyone just yeah. jump over to the, the Sidero Q&A session and I'll add Dinesh as a presenter there too.